Welcome to another episode of Autism Lifeline Links Facebook Live. Um, it is today is May 29th, and we are coming you to you from beautiful San Antonio, Texas. And we are Autism Lifeline Links. Autism Lifeline Links is a collective impact project out of San Antonio in the Kronkowski Charitable Foundation, and is designed to bring people together in the community who are care, who care for or serve people with autism or on the autism spectrum, as well as people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to try to improve the system of care, break down the silos, and really make some systems changes to kind of dig into why things might be broken and have some, um, I'd say, fierce conversations, and then also come together to see what we can do to solve that. What are we all willing and able to do to create a community that is more inclusive and more supportive of people with autism and, and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so one of the things that we do that is through um, our work groups. It is because it's a collective impact project and because it is a community-based project, um, it is really designed to make sure that we have the voices from many, many stakeholders. And what we do is we bring together groups of people or just individuals, parents, self-advocates who are you know 18 to 50 years old who have autism or an intellectual disability and people from school districts, people from nonprofits, people from foundations, people from universities, doctors, therapists. We bring everyone together and we have multiple work groups that are focused on digging in and achieving systems change but it comes from a collective view. So it isn't just one agency saying, this is our mission and this is how we're gonna execute it. And the long-term goal is that this sustains itself because it is built in um, trust, communication and collaboration. So that's what Autism Lifeline Links is. And um, we do all those great things, but we also have an electronic cloud-based platform that we utilize between 14 different nonprofits who have the mission, vision and values to serve people with autism and intellectual disabilities. And so those are here on this screen right here. And these are the agencies that are part of the electronic referral system. And what that really means to a self-advocate with um, autism or a caregiver of somebody with autism is you could go to our website and register and I'll cover that at the end so we can get to our fun topic today. But um, they can go to our website and register and then a care coordinator will reach out to them and find out what they need and they can do electronic referrals to each of these and any of these 14 organizations and then someone from that organization calls you and that way we're reducing that stress and anxiety instead of saying here mom here's three different phone numbers to three different nonprofits and here you go good luck trying to call them while you're working or managing kids especially now in covid you're a teacher you're a parent you're a maid you're like so how do we do that and so um, that's what Autism Lifeline Links does as far as the electronic referral system. So I want to talk today about how these subjects come up. We just talked about that. And so in our community engagement work group, we are always trying to create different content for people. And a lot of times we are talking about waivers, long-term services and supports waivers. These are We'll go into some more detail about them, but basically they allow someone to live in the community and have the supports they need to, to thrive and, 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 and be well. Um, so one thing that we learned when we started to fish around into why isn't this working? Why is it so hard for people to get on waivers? Why don't people understand it? Um, and one of the things was changing the vernacular for us internally, which is really hard because many of us have been in this field for um, you know 20 to 40 years. So trying to change the way you refer to something has been really important. And what we found was the term, what we generally use in the field, which is Medicaid waiver program, which refers to these long-term services and supports waivers. Um, we found out that in the school district, it means something different. In the doctor's office, it means something different. So when you say Medicaid waiver to a doctor, um, if they're like, yeah, sure, we have, we get our kids on Medicaid waivers. If we say it in the school district setting, they're like, yes, we have our kids on, um, if a kid needs a Medicaid waiver, we get it. And what we really realized was we're all using the same abbreviated term, Medicaid waiver, for all vastly different things. And so in this school system, this Facebook Live today is really targeted towards um, people in the school systems, whether it's a teacher, an aide, a counselor, an administrator, um, a special ed director, we want to try to communicate with you guys and help, you know, dispel some of it, raise the awareness and ask for your help in getting this information to families. 
Um, so when Medicaid waiver terminology was used when we were talking to our Region 20 um, local authority, they were like, yeah, sure, we, we, we make sure that in the ARD um, admission review and dismissal, we do the SHARS. And we're all like, what's the SHARS? Turns out the SHARS is a school health and related services paperwork that makes sure that a school district can bill for some of the Medicaid services that they're delivering in the school. It was really a, an aha light bulb kind of moment for us to say, wow, we, 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 let, let's dig in on this. So today we have an amazing panel of beautiful, wonderful, strong, um, smart women that I'm thrilled to work with all the time. And these ladies are from Heather Long is from, if you'll just wave so people know who you are. So Heather Long is um, a licensed bachelor social worker, but she is the director of family support services here at the ARC of San Antonio. Um, and Heather does a lot of in school. She goes into the school districts and you should know if you're not local that San Antonio um, is the seventh but growing largest city in the United States of America by population. And we have 17 different independent school districts. So we don't have one school district with a unified uh, approach. We have 17 different school districts. And Heather hops around this big old city and uh, meets with teachers and schools and parents and schools to help um, them get services. And then we have Ms. Michelle Harrison, if she'll wave. And Michelle is with Alamo Heights Independent School District, one of those districts. Uh, she's the special education um, parent liaison in Alamo Heights ISD. Uh, she's also a mom of a young man on the spectrum. And then we have Katia or Kat, and Kat is a, um, a, a ASP uh, education specialist, and Kat has spent a lot of time in the school districts, but now she works at Any Baby Can in their amazing autism program. So we are so excited um, <clears throat> to have you all here today, and I hope that the teachers out there and the school administrators and anyone that's touching on um, this population learns a lot. So we're gonna start off to do some of this clarifying about what long-term services and supports waiver program is. So I'm gonna throw that to Heather because she's kind of the subject matter expert in this area. So Heather, tell us a little bit about what LTSS waivers are. Um, what, what, what's the goal? Why, why, what are these waivers? What do they do? What's the goal? So thank you, Kara. Um, so Medicaid waivers, like you said, it's been hard to switch that vernacular to long-term support services, but really, essentially, that's what they are. It's a, it's a way, it's a program um, that an individual can receive Medicaid and on top of that, some additional support services. And so what, what a waiver does is it allows the state to be really flexible in how they can provide long-term services to individuals. And so really every state has some type of Medicaid waiver funding. And so different states have different um, formats and how they implement their waiver services. So what the state of Texas did was uh, utilize that funding to offer several different waiver programs. And so in order to in order to access those programs, you have to contact different state agencies to do that. There's not one, one specific state agency that you get connected to. Um, there are several. And, um, it, and it depends also on your county of who you would contact. But what these programs do is they allow an individual to um, receive funding that allows them to live in a community-based setting rather than a residential or, um, or a residential setting, like a nursing home or a state-supported living center. It allows them to take that funding and be much more flexible and utilize that in the community. So that could be, so what that individual gets then is they receive Medicaid benefits, and then on top of that, the long-term support services. And it really depends on which waiver that you are participating in that determines the additional support services that you would receive. So just looking at the chart um, that Kara has up, that's a table of the different Medicaid waivers that are available in Bear County and Texas. And so you can see there that there's the Alamo Local Authority and Department of uh, Aging and Disability Services that facilitate 
all of the different waiver programs. Um, so some of those supports could be having someone come in the home to help with personal care assistance. It could be adaptive equipment if an individual needs uh, a shower chair or something that their typical Medicaid wouldn't cover, then uh, a waiver could enhance that Medicaid and provide that support to help them live in the community. It could be specialized therapies like massage therapy, recreational therapy, those therapies that help with social interactions. Um, it could be habilitation services. So that could be uh, funding to help an individual pay for someone to teach them independent living skills, or it could be funding to help them go to a program where they work on um, activities of daily living or pre-vocational skills. There's also some employment assistance that individuals could access through these waivers. So they're very comprehensive. And so I think that's the neat thing about it is that it's, there's all of these supports that are varied and broad and can be applied based upon not just the person's um, level of functioning or their needs, but also what the family needs or what is available in their community. So they, it may be like federally funded through the state into our COGS or our LIDAs, but it is, it's more fluid than most people can imagine. So for cat, like why, like, so why is it important? We're like, okay, this is available. Why is it important to get on these and help explain to people, like not just the why for the not to live in an institution part, but why do it more quickly and how long is the wait to get these things? So the interest list is just, it's so important. Um, because there are so many needs that your child may have and you don't always know, you know, what skills or what type of services they're gonna need once they're 18. So needs can change, right? And um, there are things that unfortunately happen where there might be some setbacks where you thought, oh, they're not gonna need that. You know, they're, you know, they're doing great. They're gonna be completely independent, but then unfortunately some things happen where they need um, more help doing things. Um, the wait list is so long, it could be up to 15 years of a wait list. So if you aren't on the list when your child is three, four, five years old, then, you know, by the time they're 18, they're, they might not be able to, you know, have those services readily available. Um, so it's just so important with the wait list being so long that you get on it as soon as possible. That also happens if you move. You need to make sure that you're getting on those wait lists wherever you're moving to. Um, because once you move, you're off. Um, as well as keeping up with, you know, calls. If they call you, you know, every year, every two years, you need to answer and you need to give them information so that you stay on the list. It's very important to stay on the list so that you're not starting back over for that 15 year wait list again. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna um, pull up while we're talking. I had really, we had really collaborative conversations with ACOG and we wanna make sure we're clarifying and being really clear about if you're like what off and what not off means and that technically no one is ever off the list. They're just no longer reachable. And so right. later on, we're going to make sure that Heather covers some of that, and I'll tee it up with um, what the what, what the mo what the best, most accurate language surrounding that is. Um, and again, this is what all does, is that what everybody, what individual organizations may not have time to dig into, we try to dig in and find out the why. Like, why is it broken? Well, because there's a lot of misunderstanding, and sometimes there's finger pointing um, in systems of care, and we're trying to say, everybody stop finger pointing and really listen, right? And not just listen, but hear why things are the way they are. And if the community or these work groups and the individuals who are in them don't believe that that's okay, we wanna change it, then how do we agree to change it together and comply with that new standard? And so when we talk about these interest lists, that's really what this comes down to is like the interest list to Cat's point is up to 15 years long. So if you're waiting until your kid's transition age, you, he's gonna be 30. By the time it happens, and by the way, that list compounds a year to two years every year based upon what federal funding through and then into the states is available and what slots each state in each legislature decides to 
um, a lot. And what I can say, that's another thing that all does. One of our other work groups is public policy and um, advocacy because we take all this information and we say, this is not okay. Now we know why it's broken and all these people from these disparate areas agree that it's not okay and we wanna change it and here's what we think could work. And we go and speak with legislators and elected officials. So those are how we make those changes, but what's really important in it, in it is educating everybody, including you all out there and teachers and advocates to know what's real and what isn't um, about things like waivers and, and whether they're important or how that happens. Um, and Kat covered like why early because it's so long. So the next thing we want to do is like shift into that um, education system mode of how um, like so, so how, why is why is this even important for a teacher, an aide, or somebody um, to know at least a thimble's full of knowledge, correct knowledge about the long-term services, sports waivers, and then what can they do about it? So, Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about um, that? Yeah, absolutely. I, if I could, though, I would like to piggyback yeah. on something that uh, that Kat said. You know. Um, she's talking about the 15 years. And when we had um, our talk in April, um, we even mentioned um, that this whole COVID pandemic, monies are going to be frozen and monies that have been available um, or earmarked for programs like this will probably be um, Limited, more limited. Limited, yeah. And our wait lists are going to be compounded even more. Like even fewer people will get to the top of the list. So those wait times are naturally going to lengthen because of, of this pandemic that we're in. Um, and also just the importance of, you know, getting on there. Um, y y like she said, like Kat said, you don't know what what issues your child may have when they're, you know, finishing high school. Um, and, and um, you know, for now, many of us, myself included, uh, up until pandemic time, we have the school to rely on for so many of those services. Like, I don't have to w worry about dayhab because for the most part, my child is in school seven hours a day, five days a week. So, that's my respite. That's my, that's his time to, to learn and make progress. When a child ages out at age 22, all of that comes to a screeching halt. And that's really when parents start to feel the need for those programs. Now I can't put him on the bus and send him to school and have someone teach him, you know, the, the personal care or, or the pre, um, <clears throat> all of those skills necessary for, you know, obtaining a job at some point. So that's when having those programs in place and having those, um, those monies in place for, you know, the, um, uh, the day have programs, the um, uh, employment assistance programs, that's when we really start to feel it. But again, if you're not on those lists back then, you're kind of, yeah, and so how do we, like, making sure that we're tailoring this to the lens of the person that our audience is, right? And so really, those things may seem abstract to a teacher or an aide. Like, why, so other than, and with great deference, this is, waivers are really about when the school bus stops, okay? Right. So how is it important, why is it important for people who are touching that um, child who's emerging into a young adult who will be an adult um, once they once the school bus stops they've spent 18 to 22 years yeah. building and nurturing and reinforcing and teaching skills yeah. to this young person and now they will not have influence lens or scope to help care for that that young that individual right. and, and that family so why should a teacher why should an aide why should an administrator give a toot about telling and educating a family about the waiver and interest list. Well, you said it. it is because they care so much. I mean, they have invested in those children. And I mean, let's face it, people don't go into education to get rich. They do it because of their love for their students. And um, I've always thought I, I've that I have a lot of respect for, for teachers. 
these last two and a half, three months have really like quadrupled that respect and admiration for them. They really do love their students. Um, and I think it's that love and that care for them that really pushes them to, um, to, to encourage parents to put their kids on these waivers. Um, my experience is very limited uh, between this district and the one we were in in Austin. And, and, and my son was, was pretty young and I, I, Heather told me all about That's right. LTSs, LTSs. Uh, Heather was, made you, so she twisted she your did. arm, she made you. No, but seriously, <laughs> talk about that, Michelle. Like, so, yeah. like you were like, because it, this is another one of those stigmas. So right. we're talking in San Antonio, at least our target, target audience is, we're also, by the way, the fastest growing city in the United States of America. We are also the poorest per capita city in the United States of America, which is not a badge of honor, but it is the truth because we are a um, tourism, primarily our, our big chunk of industry is tourism and trade. Um, so when you're talking, when our, when our target audience today that this will be blasted to is the school district people, they could be teaching in respectfully Michelle's district, which is the wealthiest district, or they could be teaching somewhere on the South or West side, which is, is, is beyond disenfranchised. So talk a little bit about whatever your income is, why does this matter? Well, like, yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned earlier that, that it's, it's the language and that, that we use maybe incorrectly, which is why we're trying to push for LTSS versus Medicaid waiver programs. There's just a misconception about it. When Heather talked to me and, and honestly, someone may have mentioned it to me when he was three or four, uh, but it wasn't until Heather sat in my living room with me and explained it to me and said, this has nothing to do with your income right now. It doesn't matter what you and your husband make. This is based on what he will potentially be able to make when he turns 18, but because the wait is so long, we do it now. So, so that was huge for me. And, uh, and that's one of the things that I talk uh, to parents that I talk to all the time. And, and another thing, you know, people, sort of put it off because they think, oh, that's so far away. When you get that diagnosis at three or four at five, you think, you know, my baby, that's such a long time away. I'll get to it eventually. And then, you know, life happens and you've got bigger problems to deal with that you don't ever get to it. Um, so, so one of the things, Michelle, is that uh, the, the, that point being uh, one of our other Facebook Lives, which was from the Texas Transition Conference and Giovanni Washington, who is one of the people at the Alamo Area Council of Governments or the, our LIDA, our ACOG, where the, some of these waivers are uh, maintained and where those lists are maintained and where you register. And so Giovanni put it in, in the simplest terms that I, I have ever really heard. He said, okay, you're right. Maybe you're a, I got it family, we say, or we don't need it. We don't need Medicaid. Da, da, da. And the stigma of some of those things, especially in Texas, Giovanni said, let's think of it this way. When that young person, no matter their cognitive level of functioning, turns 18, what is the probability that they will be uh, working a full-time job with full medical benefits and insurance? Yeah. Yeah, and pretty, pretty, slim. pretty low, right? And, or they risk losing other things. So at the end of the day, he's like, so by default, once that person turns 18, they will be Medicaid qualified. So it isn't about, to your point, your income at this point, it's about where are we projecting that young person to be in those years to come down the line. So Kat, when we talk about, or we talked about teachers, we've talked about mom's perspective, we've talked about, you know, the systems. So when it comes to how does, all right, so what, how, right? How, how do I do this? What, maybe pull up this, like we've got this five things to know, talk a little bit about that. And then how does somebody start? And I'll go back to the other slide. You can highlight that for us, Kat. Sorry, can you <laughs> highlight what we need to know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, highlight the need to know. And like, how does somebody get on these lists? So, okay, all right, fine. You, you've got us convinced. We need to tell parents that they need to get on this list. How do you do it? How do you start that process? So I think one of the best things is to really reach out and have someone help you. We have ACOG, Any Baby Can, The Art. We're here to help. We can sit down with you. We can help you get on the interest list and help you fill out that paperwork to get you there. Because it is, it can be a little overwhelming and it can be a little 
you know, stressful if you don't, if you're not understanding or it gets a little confusing and you want someone to help us, we're here. Call us, call ACOG, call the ARC, and we will be able to sit down with you and help fill that out. If you want, you can also go and fill it out online by yourself. Um, but we as agencies are always available to help you. So you can, Kara's getting, yep. yep, you can just contact these numbers, you can call and you can register. But if you want, any baby can, the ARC and ACOG are here to help. And can I, and let me just say too, um, with class, MDCP and deafblind multiple disability, that's a statewide number. So that's, so if you're, no matter where you're at in Texas, you can call that number and get on any one of those three waiting lists. But for HCS and Texas Home Living Waiver, it's based on your county. So mm -hmm. that, the one that Kara is showing there, Alamo Local Authority, that's only for Bear County. So if you're in a different county, it's based on your LIDA or your, your local authority. And so again, that's something that ARC or any baby can, we can help you determine who your local authority is based on your county. And then that's who you would contact to get on those two wait lists. But also it, it can be a little confusing too, because on, on the, the chart there, it talks about financial eligibility and um, diagnosis. Uh, don't let that fool you. It's not saying that you have to have Medicaid to get on the list. It's just saying once that person comes off the list, they will be getting Medicaid services or they, they will be qualifying for Medicaid. And I think that throws a lot of people off as they think they have to get, have to be on Medicaid even to get on the wait list, which is new. Heather, that's a super good point. And I want to dig into that a little bit and yeah. share a little more. So, so two things to cover when we're talking vernacular, right? Our mm -hmm. LIBA, right? So mm -hmm. local intellectual and developmental disability authority. Right. Every, all over Texas, at least, there are LIDAs. I think there are 11 or 13 LIDAs. A lot. How, how we're <laughs> yeah. broken up because it's a honking state, right? And so <laughs> the, the, every LIDA. So we have um, our ACOG, Alamo Area Council of Governments, is our LIDA, our local intellectual developmental disability Correct. authority. Mm -hmm. Now, the one there's Hill Country. There mm -hmm. is... Um, uh, Braz, I there's, mean, every, yeah, everybody... There's Camino Hill Real, Hill Country... Hill Country. Blue bonnet, yeah. <laughs> so those are those are the ones that touch our car. They touch, they touch fair. Mm -hmm. So that's how you get on. They are the people who manage this. So two things, people are like, well, why is it two different places? Well, Texas did a lot of reshuffling about what six, seven years ago with all right. these departments and merged and submerged and got rid of. And when that happened, some of these processes got a little wonky. So mm -hmm. what in the end is you've got these three um, waivers or interest lists that are maintained still by the Department of Health uh, of Aging and Disability Services, which is also, by the way, out of the Department of Health and Human Services. And so then you, and then you have the, the little ones. So second to that, Heather, is the processes, right? Mm -hmm. So for the MDCP, Medically Dependent Children's Program, CLASS, Community Living Assistance Support, and mm -hmm. DeafBlind, Mostly Disabled, DDMD. Right. You just call this phone number. You just call that phone number and you can get on that list in, in a matter of like five minutes. And, and they, they ask very, a very basic questionnaire and um, you, you need to have your child or your young adult adults uh, social security number and Medicaid number handy if they're, if they're, if they're on Medicaid. And that's, um, then, then they're on. So um, the other thing that's important is then, and so ACOG, you call the number or any baby can or ARC can Help, help you, you do sit down and help you. We, we sit and help people do it yeah. while we're meeting with and, them. And Michelle totally does it at her school. We don't know how many <laughs> school. She does. Michelle's going, yeah, because we found out maybe Michelle shouldn't be home. But anyway, so <laughs> we'll ask forgiveness later on for great Hey, when ACOG has the applications in their waiting room and you that can just take a pile. Them. That's right. That's right. Let's right. take a pile. I'm with you. Um, but what is what's interesting in, in all of this is what Heather just said, which is even more important. I'm so glad you said it, Heather, which is don't let the stuff on this form fool you. Yeah. And we were talking before we got on this call, um, world, that um, a young woman that Michelle uh, became in contact with believes that her child would be born with Down syndrome. Um, as soon as that child's born and has social security number, guess what? Put them on the list. 
Right. Or if you have a kiddo, particularly those of us who are uh, targeting the spectrum space, and uh, maybe uh, Kat can, has a little more to say this, like a lot of times your child may have been in an early intervention program and they're like, ah, oh, something's not right. They discharge from that at three years old, but they don't have like something that is Down syndrome or cerebral palsy, something that has a definitive lifelong development of disease. It's one of these things that they still don't have a name right, for what's the going on with this kid, but something really- Formerly important. known as PDD NOS. Thank you, PDD, Pervasive Developmental Disorder, NOS, which they were not diagnosing until at least five, right? So you have this huge gap of two, three, four, five years before maybe you get the diagnosis. What's really important to know about these guys is get them on, because what happens is years down the line, when the number comes up, then, the COG or the LIDA or the, or, or the state says, okay, now it's time to review your disability determination right. mm -hmm. and then it's done. So if by some chance your kid never got an autism diagnosis and they had just really attention deficit sensory issues and with medication and therapies, everything's good. And then all of a sudden you get this call 15 years later, you're like, oh, we don't need it. Then good, somebody moves up to the list. But to Heather's point, don't let Medicaid term, don't let disability diagnosis, it doesn't mean every Tom, Dick, and Harry should just jump on these lists, but get on the list if it appears that your child will have a lifelong disability because the determination is not decided until you are much closer to the front of that line. So I'm so glad you said that, Heather. I didn't even have it in the notes. Okay, mm -hmm. so now Kat, um, what, what, are, what were you going to talk about? I just, I set that up because I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> I, I think oh, I think one thing is we wanted to clarify, and then can you talk about um, how that happens? But this is we there's always been an assumption, and this is again part of what our job is in this community network and leading this is. It's like, well, I got kicked off the list. I'm like, well, ultimately, oh, yeah. what what the clarifying vernacular is is that no one is ever removed from that list. To be clear, they become inactive. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. And so yeah, it feels like you're kicked off you become inactive. And this is where advocating, educating both people and parents, you have a responsibility to answer a phone call twice a year. I mean, once every two years or let them know something's gone on. Can you talk a little bit about that cat? Like why it's important, but to know that no one's kicking anybody off a list. There is some reciprocal responsibility of the parent or caregiver. So Kat, if you can touch on then Michelle as a mom, touch on that and how you try to message that to people that are, you know, our last Facebook thing, Michelle, like it's, you do have some, you, you've got to let them know where you are. Mm -hmm. And you do, you really need to, um, you know, pick up that phone every two years. And also sometimes they will send a letter. So also look out for that. You, you do have that responsibility because we want to keep them, you know, high up on the list. We want to make sure that we're active because we want, you know, the second that your kid turns 18, we want them to be eligible for services so that, you know, they get help. They get all the help that they need. They are, you know, supported and that you're supported as well. Um, so it is really important to stay active and to stay, you know, available as well as, you know, letting them know, oh, some things have changed. They are needing some more help. Let's, you know, revisit that. Um, they might need some other interests. We might need to look at that. Here are some updates. Keep them updated. Um, and you also, you never know what they're gonna need when they're 18. So have an open mind as well. The last thing you wanna do is have, have been waiting 15 years and then found out that they didn't have a correct phone number on you. And so you lost your slot because they've tried to contact you after um, 15 years and just because of not having that correct phone number or address then you've lost the slot. Mm -hmm. And in a way I can further clarify Heather to that point and Kat is yeah. that they, they you're, you're still there. It just, when they call that number. And they need to have every, the correct every, number. <laughs> call in that number and they'll document it. But you know, by the first round, if the number's two years old at year four, the yeah. number's four years old, the numbers, so it, it just, the probability is slim. So right. thanks guys. You know, and Michelle, anything more on that about that response? Like you have enough to worry about as a mom, I want to be really clear. Like as a mom with a guy with special needs, like we understand that, but we 
if they can't find you, they can't help, right? Well, I mean, it's like if if you thought you might have the winning lottery ticket, you'd check to see yeah. if, you know, did my <laughs> number come one. up? Yeah. That's, a, that's a good so way to look. I think, I think one of the things that we talked about, I don't know if it was on the April one, is that, you know, pick a date, put it mm -hmm. in your, you know, most of us have a smartphone. On their birthday. birthday. On your yeah, birthday. on their birthday. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things you do every year on their birthday is just call and say, hey, where are we on the list? Checking in. Mm -hmm. Checking in. Oh, Michelle, talk about that. You can call and find out what your number is. Tell yeah, them about that. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I actually, I came across my stuff because I was, I, I was, chatting with Katya about something else earlier. Um, and I was like, oh, here's my, my form. And I pulled it out and I've been looking at like, okay, well, this is the 2017, 2018, 2019. But yes, you can call. Either you've got the paperwork and, and so many of us with kiddos uh, with a diagnosis, you know, we have either the folder or the binder or the whatever of the, the book of Wyatt is what we have. And you've got all of your stuff in there. Just keep it there look at it every once in a while. But I mean, for me, putting it in my phone so that it comes up and it's a reminder, oh yeah, I need to check. And either, you know, call in and say, hey, it's Michelle again, just calling to see where we're at. We've moved, you know, yeah. you have our most recent uh, address, you know, do you still have my email and my phone number? And just, just do that. It's, I mean, Again, if, if you thought, you know, your kid might win the lottery at some point, you would be checking on that. This is the same thing. You need to check I on I love that. I love why people all adopt the, the lottery ticket. It's true. If it's sitting right there, you're going to go check your wallet. You, you just, yeah. you, you're going to do it. Yeah. If, you know, the odds are slim that all of a sudden Texas funded 120,000 slots, but no, I mean, yeah. You know, did our number come up? Yeah. Did our number come up? Yeah. And what we can't tell you is that, I mean, that, that is actually a, a pretty accurate number, but the number of people who are on these waiver and interest lists, it's approximately 120,000 people across the state of Texas. And in our COG alone, it's 6,000 people, 6,500 people approximately. And that number compounds every day if we're doing a good job, right? So what do we say in our public policy meetings and in these uh, community engagement group meetings is, Listen, the worst thing we can do is the best thing we can do and getting help from school systems and teachers and educators and parents and everybody is we do a good job of educating people about long-term services, sports waivers, their importance and how to get on them. And the next legislative session, our list in this community went from 6,000 to 10,000 people on the interest list. We have a bigger drum to bang to say we need more slots released, right? So it's it's an unfortunate thing to say, we really need you to get on this list, mom. But by the way, the list is 15 to 17 years long. Like, somebody want to talk to that? Like, how do you, because some people will be like, whatever, that's stupid, I'm never going to get it. So I love the lottery ticket analogy, but how do you help convince a parent that this is something, it's, it's hard. We talk about it all the time across our entire industry. Um, because you just might be so disheartened. Well, um, I mean, it's, I, 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 I tell parents all the time, you know, the, the 45, and I do, I, I sit before, before COVID, I would sit with a parent and I'd say, give me 45 minutes to an hour. I will sit with you. I'll buy you a cup of coffee at local coffee and we will go through, you know, bring social security card. You'll need to, you know, some, some basic information about your child, you know, diagnoses, um, <laughs> will sit, you go through it. And if you have a question, I will help you as best I can. I'll, you know, I'll sit with you while you call the, the 877 number up in Austin. Um, but it's 45 minutes to an hour that if your child never needs it, great, you wasted 45 minutes. But if your child needs it when they turn 18, that's the best 45 minute investment you've ever time. made. Yeah. All right. Again, so, can I can I add something onto that real quick, Karen? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just uh, just saying that um, I think as uh, I meet with families that have older um, adult children, um, I think I can kind of bring that to some of the younger families and say, you know, some of some of the biggest fears I think families have is what's going to happen to my child when I'm no longer here, and this is putting into place 
something that will provide a whole array of supports for your for your child, for your family, for your the sibling that might be taking care of the child to have available as an adult. And so I, I think maybe giving the, and then and a lot of times families will say, well, now I, you know, I feel like something's been taken off my shoulder. Now I've got something to in place that eventually we'll be able to get some services and, and have that support down the line when they're older, when I'm older. Okay, I, I love that, Heather, thank you. I think um, we, we're so good at talking and getting excited about this kind of stuff. We're running out of time. So I want to start to wrap this. But before I do, I want to bring it back to what the target audience for this was. We hope that we didn't overwhelm you. And we know your education jargon world is pretty deep. So we hope we didn't overwhelm you. The key things to know are right here on this slide. And again, we'll uh, make sure that these are, are attached. Um, and that just letting, if you do one thing, give, these, give this piece of paper to everyone that you know. All of the information on how to access lists is there, at least to get a start, or have the send the tell them to call the ARC or tell them to call any baby can or tell them to call COG. Um, the hand holding that will happen at ARC and any baby can is is more intense because it's what they do as organizations opening up a case and um, creating that uh, path for you. But I want to close by saying that, um, or almost close, but I want to say that. Um, I want Kat just to tell us because what, so all that, if you do one thing, get families this, I hope we've conveyed the importance of it, but Kat, when, like what, are, what is some times that a teacher, an educator, a, a cafeteria lady, I mean like anybody, an administrative counselor, like when's that, when's a good time to open this dialogue or to just say, hey. So, um I know arts are extremely packed in, you know, it's 45 minutes, you don't have a ton of time, but if you can, or a pre art you're meeting with that parent, you're talking about the progress of your student, talk about, um, talk about this, you know, this is a great time. So before an ARD would be perfect. Also parent teacher conferences, you're talking about the progress of the kid, talk about this. This is you know, a great time. It's when you have the time to talk to that parent one-on-one. -on -one. Also, you know, back to school, you're having that meeting with your class, bring this up. You know, it's special ed teachers, you're meeting with those families before school starts. What a great time. And any time that you're really face to face with a parent is perfect because you're gonna be able to explain to them a little bit more than just on the phone or, you know, sending it home in the backpack. Home in the backpack, but do it face to face as well. I love that because I know what my neurotypicals child, both children, I mean, 19 and 13, what their backpacks look like. And mm -mm. Um, so thank you for that. You know, so uh, meet the teacher night, uh, any other random parent teacher conference, resource mm -hmm. fairs. If you have a class newsletter, if you have a school newsletter, if you have any or blogs or face any of those things. Um, and then ARC holds trainings during the summer on, on this topic as well. So all of those things just, we, we, we enlist you in our, in our journey to help um, raise awareness for these long-term services and supports um, waiver programs so that all the work that you did as an education system and as a team um, is not for naught when that person leaves and when the school bus stops and that family can have some peace of mind. So we wanna thank you for that. Um, this is the five things to know way um, form. This is the cool, um, Keep it simple. Uh, it seems complex, but it's keep it simple. Don't let anything intimidate you. We'll also have this, which is a detailed list of um, all, each of the different um, interest lists. So it depends upon what it is. It gives you more detail on how to get on it, what it provides, what it doesn't provide. Um, so that's there. And other than that, I want to um, thank very much Kat and Heather and Michelle and your respective organizations at uh, Alamo Heights ISD and ARC and Any Baby Can, all doing amazing work every single day on behalf of people with autism and intellectual disabilities and the families and those who care and love for them. Um, so please do always, we have our Facebook Lives, make, make friends with us on Facebook. Um, it's actually where most of our um, up-to-date kind of content is. Um, Leslie Bellew, uh, who does all this for us, is amazing, and she's the executive director of Southland Fields. 
She's always pulling down content from other places to make sure you can maybe look at one place and have that done. If you are interested in registering and you are on the spectrum um, and or have a loved one on the spectrum and you live in the area, um, you can go to Autism Lifeline links, go to our website, um, which is here right now. And um, here you click the purple register now button and it really is a three minute click, click, click process. And like I said, from there, a care coordinator will call you and start to provide those uh, resources for you. And uh, what also happens there is, like I said, we collect the information on the back end so we can try to impact public policy and elected officials and funding for our community. We also have um, here that's a really neat resource is the community resource guide. We have it in English and in Spanish. We have the NBB Can Kerr County and the NBB Can New Braunfels um, community ones, all three in English and Spanish. And um, these are a real big effort from all of us in the community to stop pr printing and doing and providing our own individual lists, but to consolidate them and put them all in one place so we have the best first guess. But this has advocacy, camps, recreation, churches, haircuts, everything that you would need um, that is really focused on all of those things. So we want to thank you again, and we really appreciate um, any advocacy and any attention to this issue. If you have any questions, you can go to a contact us at Autism Lifeline Links as well. Thank you, ladies, and everyone stay safe. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.